workshop oh, on the origins of consciousness. <coughs> uh, a lot of really fascinating talks lined up, I think, between now and 5.15. Um, I'll just say a couple of words about what I was hoping for when I put this workshop together. What I mean by consciousness, what I mean by origins. Um, I think what will become clear as we go along is that there are many, many different properties associated with consciousness, many different things we might mean by that word. Um, some quite possibly uniquely human and some not. I mean, if you think, for example, of things like inner speech, you know, the capacity of forming an explicitly verbalized plane of thought, that's a property associated with consciousness that may well turn out to be uniquely human. But what I'm really interested in is what philosophers tend to call phenomenal consciousness, what people in the animal welfare literature and animal sentience research tend to call sentience, the capacity for subjective experience, to have experiences with a, a phenomenal qualitative subjective character that seems to resist third person description. So when you're injured, you don't simply detect noxious stimuli, you feel pain. When you look at a blue sky, you don't simply detect light of a certain wavelength, you see a blue sky. Your experience has this qualitative character. As Thomas Nagel famously put it, you know, when an organism is phenomenally conscious, there's something it's like to be that organism. And that, I think, is a property that is quite probably not uniquely human, leading to the question of, well, which animals, if, if any other than humans, have that property? How, many, you know, how do we tell? How many times does this property of phenomenal consciousness evolved if it's evolved more than once? If you think of something like eyes, nervous systems, we know that eyes have evolved multiple times. They've evolved separately in vertebrates and in vertebrates. Uh, one of the things I want us to think about today is whether phenomenal consciousness is something like that, something that has evolved over and over again in different lineages, rather than a completely unique thing that has only evolved once. And that in turn leads us on to questions of, well, what is the function of this thing, phenomenal consciousness or sentience? What does it do for animals that have it? Um, why did it initially evolve? How did it originate? And how can what we're learning from the neuroscience of consciousness shed light on that? So these are the questions I want us to think about throughout the whole day. The morning is going to be quite focused on the theme of invertebrate consciousness. And we have three fantastic speakers who are all doing really cutting-edge empirical research in this area. Then in the afternoon, there'll be more of a focus on more abstract questions and, and sort of general theory. Um, so in the morning, Bjorn Brems, Lars Chief, and Paul Bellwood. Our first speaker, Bjorn Brems, from the University of Regensburg, is going to talk to us about the neurogenetics of creative problem solving. Bjorn. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm not quite sure I really have a whole lot to say about consciousness. I don't really work on consciousness. Um, hey, I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> my experience, now this is the second time I'm invited to a, 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 a meeting or a, an event on consciousness. And the last time, everyone got up and said, I'm not <laughs> So, um, and I don't, I'm not really sure I know what consciousness is. I sort of feel like what my own experience of consciousness is. And that is, uh, that entails that animals actually don't have consciousness. Um, not the way I experience it. Um, and, and I think, and I'll make the parallel to language a little bit on and off throughout the presentation. Um, it's a little bit like language. So, I don't think any other species other than us have language. I mean, almost all animals sort of communicate in one form or another, but language, only we have it. But that doesn't mean that we can't study certain prerequisites and components of language in other, in other animals, um, such as uh, songbirds or um, other animals. So I think um, while consciousness is a uniquely human term, and I also think, or feel, I have to say, I haven't, I can't really formulate much about that, other than I don't, it feels wrong to extend definitions of terms such, they, such that they encompass virtually everything and one has to do that all the time. And so, well, I mean, 
if I have to use adjectives all the time, the term means everything already anyway, I might as well you know, come up with a different term rather than having composite terms, eventually triple composite terms or something like that. And so just as I don't think it makes sense to call every, every form of communication language, I don't think it makes sense to call every form of cognition consci consciousness. Um, and so um, in preparing for today, I sort of thought, okay, what, is, is there anything about grasping at straws? Is there anything that fly research can contribute um, to some component, maybe, um, or, or subcomponent or prerequisite for human consciousness? Well, there I am again. I just used uh, an adjective for consciousness. Uh, since there isn't, I think, anything else other than human consciousness. Um, one thing that um, I found was the concept of the self, in that it's sort of very often mentioned together with consciousness, consciousness and the self, consciousness and the self, the self, naturalism, consciousness, and first person stance. So that apparently um, is something fairly important for consciousness. And the self sort of entails a, a degree of autonomy such that if, if I were just um, passively responding to external stimuli, uh, there wouldn't be any need for a self. I would just do whatever the environment tells me. So the self is sort of an internal, uh, internal something um, that makes me so at least partially independent from a whole host of non-self factors. It doesn't mean that I'm completely independent. That would be essentially solipsism. <laughs> but, um, it's, it's, it, the self, as I understand it, provides me with a sort of autonomy that allows me to integrate various factors before I then decide what to do. And that, I think, is something that one can study in a whole host of animals, because if they weren't autonomous, they probably wouldn't be around for very long. And a very simple, very old experiment that we just redid in our lab uh, gives the first sort of aspect of this um, that I think is very fundamental to essentially every organism with a nervous system, I would guess. That experiment goes as follows. Um, what you have here is, which you can't see, is on the inside. Um, there is an elevator. So first we put flies, a group of flies, let's say 20 or 50 or something, into a little tube like this. And we have them accommodate there for minutes or so, both for dark adaptation of their eyes and also to settle down in the apparatus. And then there, there is an elevator sort of here where we can push the flies into. And then we move the elevator down and we have a light up here. And the flies can decide whether they want to go in the bright tube or in the dark tube. And if we haven't done anything to the animals, then as you can tell by virtually every window uh, in the summer, then what the animals are doing is they move towards the light. Most of them are doing that, not all of them. So if we now then just you know take this tube out, take this tube out, and count the animals in the elevator, in the bright tube, and in the dark tube, then what happens, and this is uh, the work of Isabel Steyman, so she was a bachelor student in our lab. The experiment itself is several <coughs> decades old, uh, and the result that I'm going to tell you has been described many times, but the data have never been shown, so we thought we'd just uh, provide our, the data ourselves because we want to see if uh, what's written in the old literature is really correct. And so what we find is that you know about 70% of the animals go in the uh, bright tube, then uh, maybe about 10, 15 or so percent go into the dark tube, and some uh, are caught in the elevator either because they're running back and forth or because they don't run at all. So now the interesting experiment, of course, will be well, what happens if we take the animals? from the bright and from the dark parts of these teammates and ask them again, where do you go? So first we start out with the bright ones and it turns out that roughly to about the same percentage they choose to go to the light or to stay in the dark. And then we take the dark part, the animals that stay in the dark part, and pretty much the same way. So what one can take from this simple experiment is that this is truly a choice. It means that just because most of the animals walk towards the light in this simple you know, binary choice, it doesn't mean that we can predict the behavior of any individual animal with more than about 80% accuracy. Or 70 in this case. It doesn't matter depending on how we set the experiment up. This means without looking into the... Yes, please interrupt me. I have plenty of 
Um, does this, do, do this proportion change in any way um, as a function of how many animals, the density of animals within, within this? Very region? slightly, very slightly. It's roughly the same. If we put too many in there, they then, and we give them too little time, then most of them end up in the elevator because they're crawling on top of each other, and in the 10 seconds or so, if we only give them that, they don't have time to spread out much. But, but as that, as that in principle, not much, not much. Now what? Yes. Oh, so could, could it be that all the flies are identical, but it's like a flocking and distribution where they all try and get equally? So if we do this individually, if we do this with individual animals, we find the same thing. Oh, yeah. That's fine. Now what we do find, though, and this becomes where it becomes uh, interesting and, and in hindsight, I guess, uh, quite trivial and obvious, is that not all the animals are the same. So this is, in this case, if this is a wild type population, but it's also the case actually uh, for highly inbred strains that are almost isogenous. What we find is a normal distribution. So if we if we keep doing this, we take all those again and test them again and all those again, then you will see that this difference here, this tiny tiny difference, gets a little higher every time, and this one gets a little lower every time. So what you then end up with is individual animals, if you do this often enough, you have to start with 100 flies, you do it often enough, uh, in a very tedious way, <laughs> or with a different machine, then you end up with individual animals. And you have a track record, how often have they chosen what? And what you find is a normal, more or less normal distribution, with a mean at about 70%, this is where most animals have, you know, plus minus a few percent, have 70% choice. And then you have very, very few animals that choose light all the time, and very, very few animals that choose dark all the time. So the population is heterogeneous, but essentially what you have is a probability of probabilities that essentially peaks at around 70%. That's what you find in, in, in this experiment. And in hindsight, of course, as I said, this is, not, this is quite to be expected. If it wouldn't be that way, we wouldn't have any evolution going on. If all animals of a population are the same, there wouldn't really be much going on. So in, in, uh, in a way, you could say that um, this already this simple experiment, which was conducted uh, originally much before this, before the uh, Harvard Law of Animal Behavior was coined in the 1980s, um, you could say this already exemplifies this that on a carefully controlled experimental circumstances, an animal will behave as it damn well pleases. So there's an uncertainty. There's an uncertainty that is fundamental, I think, fundamental to all decisions to all animal behavior, and clearly. Um, as, as we understand more about animal behavior, we will get rid of some of that uncertainty. But the fundamental mechanisms by which these uncertainties arise, they will be around. And if they're as fundamental as they turn out to be right now, um, there will be limits as to how well we will be able to predict behavior. And um, part of this research is being done in another more experimentally controlled experiment than in this uh, mass tea maze. And that is when we put flies, uh, individual flies, uh, in a measuring device. And we do this by gluing a little copper hook in the head and between you know, the head and thorax and the neck of the fly. And this little copper hook uh, then is uh, uh, held in a clamp. And that clamp is stationary, so the fly can't fly away. It can't rotate. It can't do anything other than you know, moving its antennae a little bit, beating its wings, moving its legs, moving its abdomen. Now, with a video camera, we could record all of this. Now, what we, the only thing we are recording, though, is the effect that the wing beating of the animal has on the force it generates around its vertical body axis. It's your torque. And this is a torque signal that we're measuring here with this torque meter. Let's say this is roughly corresponding to left torque and this to right torque. And what you see is that this changes all the time. And this is a 30 minute experiment sped up in about 30 seconds. And so it's important to remember that the animal is not turning, even though I say my right turns and left turns. The animal is still looking in the same direction. It's attempting those turns. And we only measure the force that it exerts on this measuring device. Now, this variability in behavior, we can also observe if we remove all the stimuli that are known to induce variability in this torque behavior. So this, actually, this particular machine that I'm uh, displaying here in this uh, cartoon is actually from the 1960s. And so in the 1960s, 
uh, and since the 1960s, um, uh, people around the world have studied all the different factors that lead to torque fluctuations in the fly. And we've carefully removed all of those. Uh, today, we use a different machine, and we let the flies fly in a ping pong ball on the inside of a ping pong ball. So there's really nothing uh, fluctuating in this animal's environment. And yet, while the animal was producing you know, a lot of left-turning torque, all of a sudden here it decides to make right turns. Even though there's nothing in the environment at this particular point in time that would instruct the animal to do that. So by a very obvious definition of spontaneous, that's spontaneous activity. This, beha this behavioral variability, and we're going to come back to the importance of behavioral variability, in this constant stimulus situation then, means that these behaviors that we observe here are actions, in this case spontaneous actions. They're not responses because nothing in the environment is there that could trigger such a response. And so there are fields of science um, where people routinely refer to behavior as responses and uh, sort of assuming that every behavior must have some sort of stimulus that it reacts to. This assumes that nervous systems are passive. Uh, I'll make the case today that nervous systems are actually the opposite. They're always active. And uh, we can, let's see if we, if we get there in the, dis in, in the discussion, in the Q&A. Um, I would even make the point that on the neurobiological level, responses don't exist. They exist on a behavioral level, on a superficial level, when we look at you know, a stimulus triggering of a behavior that certainly looks like that. But almost all the cases that I've looked at, uh, that I know, and I'd like to hear some counterexamples, examples maybe, don't really look like examples when one looks at the neuron, how the neurons are actually doing it. Far from it. Now, in this case, though, the question is always, well, I mean, flies are really simple animals, right? They only have 250,000 neurons, certainly not as smart as, as bees. And so if I take all the stimuli away, the only variability that I see is just random noise, right? I mean, if I have a, an analog radio attuned between stations, then there as well, um, I will get something out of the speakers. Uh, it'll be static, it'll be something, but it won't be flat. So it would be quite naive to assume that just because we took away all the stimuli that make torque fluctuate, there shouldn't be any fluctuating torque on the outside. And so one of the many things that we did was to use a mathematical procedure called nonlinear forecasting, in this case the SMAP procedure, um, to find out if there is a, or if, if, if this output of the fly actually is random or if it is nonlinear, because nonlinear systems can sort of exhibit random light properties that are, by the naked eye, difficult to distinguish without experience and without mathematical tools, depending on um, what kinds of system I'm looking at, difficult to distinguish from actually uh, real random sequences. And the way this works is that um, you take half of the data, so in this case, half an hour um, data, half an hour time series, you take the first 15 minutes to derive a mathematical model to predict the second half of the data. And then you tune this model from being linear to being nonlinear uh, in, in, in several steps. And if the, uh, so we do this on the x-axis, and if the correlation of the predicted data with the actual data gets better, with the nonlinearity of the model, you sort of assume, well, I mean, that if a nonlinear model is, explains the data better, then there's probably some nonlinear process underlying the data. Such that when you then uh, test your data, if you have a flat line in this SMAP procedure, then you assume this is a linear or, or a stochastic process underlying uh, the time series that we measured. And if you see an increasing slope, which means that nonlinear models are better at predicting the data than linear models, you assume that there must be some nonlinear nonlinearity underlying the time series histories. There are infinitely many ways of changing something from linear to nonlinear. You must have some principal uh, subset of that infinite set of possible changes. Well, so that, that is built in into the SMAP procedure. It has a weighting factor that makes the model more or less linear. And uh, so that's the, that's the weighting parameter that we're just turning. Um, so if we look at the fly data, what we find, so this is the weighting parameter, goes from 0 to 4, 0 meaning linear and 4 meaning maximally, four, 0 meaning linear, 4 meaning, meaning maximally nonlinear, and here the correlation coefficient, what we see, if we look at, you know, in this case, 13 
such flight traces, if you look at the torque, we find an increase. Now, because I'm not an expert in these mathematical um, uh, analyses, um, I've had the, the inventor of this SMAP procedure, the person who developed it, help us implement it, but the person who actually computed everything and could tell you in great detail mathematically how that actually works uh, is Alexander Mayer, a computer scientist. And I wanted to understand what it is that this SMAP procedure is actually picking up. So we generated data where we knew what comes out so that we can get an idea of what this procedure is capable of doing. So we took a, a, a software agent from the literature that has a nonlinear activator that activates a right turn and a left turn oscillator that mutually inhibit each other. And we, we subtract those from each other and get an output that's also roughly right and left in arbitrary values. And so we can tune and play around with the uh, formulae, with the, with the uh, uh, equations that run the software agent to generate dummy data to understand what's going on. And because this is a nonlinear system, this, this software agent is a nonlinear system, we can tune it such that it gets a nice, uh, very steep slope here. So at least this part of the, um, uh, of the SMAP procedure works. <laughs> However, we can also tune it and play around with it, with the, with the software agent, for it to be flat. And what uh, still confuses me, um, and we don't have, since this uh, has been resting for a while, uh, this project, and we move to more biological aspects, uh, as I come to later, um, what I find confusing is that this linear automat, this uh, software agent, looks pretty much like a flat. So I have those two, I have those two uh, traces um, printed on paper on my wall, and I sometimes when I talk to students about this when they come for a project and I ask them, what do you think is the fly and what is the software agent, um, none of them really ever gets it you know, consistently right. What happens if you use this procedure on other natural processes like the weather or geological processes or behavior that plants produce? So this was originally, that's an excellent question. So this SMAP procedure was originally developed by George Sukihara, this is the other author of this paper, on this paper, um, to study food webs in marine ecosystems. This is from, from uh, La Jolla in San Diego. And uh, he was interested in, well, are the uh, abundances, species abundances in marine food webs, are those you know just random fluctuations? Or are they reflecting the nonlinear relationship in, within the food webs between the species? And so in the food webs, you also find this nonlinear signature. So I would uh, think that in certain, depending on what you measure in the weather, depending on you know, how much that is actually dependent on the nonlinearities in, in the weather system or on truly random processes, you will also find nonlinear signatures in these time series data. Um, so I'm translating all of this to chemotaxis, you know, just because I can think of chemotaxis is just a couple of molecules interacting in a particular way. And it's a biochemical network, and biochemical networks by their very nature tend to be nonlinear. And so you put noise into a biochemical network and you get things that have nonlinearity. Right. Um, I don't see that that's choice. You know, I don't see the relationship between saying that there's nonlinearity in biochemical networks and saying that the fly's making a choice. Good. Uh, I think that's an excellent point. Um, the uh, what we will what we will probably find what we'll probably find is that we're going to run if we look at so this is what I'm going to show you next is that of course we're trying to look at the neur the neurons that are doing this and how they're doing this. Um, my hunch is and we, until we know how the neurons are doing it, we, I can't really tell you. What I can tell you is that it's not just noise. There's something else in it, right? Um, and that there is a nervous structure, a neuronal structure attached to it that has been uh, selected by evolution um, to do that sort of thing. Now, my hunch is that probably we will have a hard time assigning choice um, or attention or decision-making, these sorts of words that we use on a superficial level to the way neurons are doing it. Because once we find how it works, we say, well, the neurons are doing something, they're doing it in a particular way, but what we think is choice does not map onto neural activity. Neural activity is spikes. Neural activity is, you know, 
inhibition excitation. And from, from what data I've seen so far, what we know about attention-like processes and other decision-making processes where people are a little bit, so especially, especially in uh, uh, um, uh, sensory decision-making, um, what looks like a decision on the outside just looks like some kind of neuronal activity that is ill, that doesn't really fit our decision-making concept, concept, which is one of weighing pros and cons. Now, I don't think we'll ever really find the, the weighing of pros and cons in the firing of neurons. Why should we? In the first place. Exactly. So, I think if we will find probably quite a bunch of um, more or less complicated neuronal processes that lead to one potential neural pattern being generated over another. And we will then, after the fact, have to think how well that sort of mechanism fits what we think is a decision on the outside. And it may well be that we will have to make a decision, we will have to make a decision, if a particular phenomenon, a particular behavior in an animal is a decision, uh, and then say, well, whatever neuronal mechanisms we find, then reflect that decision. That's what I would, uh, would predict, but as, far, as long as we don't know how it actually works, we don't really have a good answer. I guess I'm just wondering why are you choosing, what, what justifies the use of the word choice in this instance? Because if, if uh, because the point, the, the, main, the main issue is, is, the, or is, is much of the causation lying inside the architecture of the nervous system or outside? And by outside, I don't mean physically outside, but um, you know, some random event that occurs that has nothing, um, that is not, you know, not picked up by the brain, that is not used by the brain, and is just totally incidental. Uh, there was a question there before, and then. Yeah, sorry, picking on the schema of access thing, so uh, wouldn't you think it's easier to actually think about choice picking a very simple organism like bacteria? We know exactly how they choose going to left or right. We know exactly. So why do we need neurons to understand the choice? Um, you probably don't in, in principle. I wouldn't say so, but again, I think this is very similar to the analogous, uh, or it is very not similar, it's analogous to the question of consciousness and language. If we assign choice to every, to every system that bifurcates, we'll have many chemical systems. We don't even need to go to, um, uh, as we know from Ilya Pugrins and other people's work in the 1960s, we don't need to go to bacteria uh, to have systems that bifurcate. They're physical and chemical systems, and so we'll say the system makes a choice. I don't think, um, so I think, I think it's problematic to always, I mean, it's a good debate. I think it's a good debate to be had if we should always extend words that have evolved to describe essentially human interactions to all kinds of other phenomena, and then use adjectives to say, well, it's a physical choice, it's a chemical choice, it's a biological choice, right? Or if we say, no, we'll have to use other words. There's arguments for using our words everywhere, because otherwise we have to invent new words all the time. But then again, we have Latin, Latin names in biology and in other fields all the time. So we use new words whenever we don't have, whenever common language doesn't work. That's a good argument for having everything you know, described by the common language. But there are many misunderstandings. And we may devise the wrong experiments if we think, and if we use the wrong words. I mean, the. the the experiment, my favorite example for that is always calling Pluto a planet, just because everything around the sun must be a planet. And then that prevented people for 30 years to f discover the other Kuiper Belt objects because they thought, well, it's a planet, so we don't have to look for any other objects out there. So it's very, you know, there are good arguments on either side to say, well, this is a choice, so this is not. I would make the case here that it makes sense to use choice for nervous systems. But other people may say it makes sense to use choice for physical and chemical systems as well, or, or organisms without nervous systems. So I want to make sure that Bjorn has an opportunity to finish his talk. <laughs> right. Please encourage everyone to save, your, to save your questions to the end. We can come back to all these issues at the end. <laughs>
Well, I'm just going to offer you the language of function rather than language of choice, but maybe that's something to do. I say that, that too. Yeah. <laughs> Does it serve a function? Was it an evolved function or a developed function? Exactly. And questions like that are much more precise than is there a choice being made? And, the, and I mean, the, the function here is quite clear. If this is a, uh, if this is a prey, if the, a fly is a prey item, uh, that sort of choice that is random-like, and I didn't show the data that we looked at how random it actually is. We quantified that. Um, clearly, prevents you from becoming lunch because if if it's not choice, um, and uh, well, if it were purely random, then you wouldn't be able to find anything, uh, and if it were uh, not close to random, but determined, purely deterministic, then it would be predictable and you would be lush. Uh, similarly, if you're a predator, if you'd always be in the same spot and always hunt in the same way, you'll also be in survival for quite long. So there's a case to be made that selection favors those that can incorporate and, and, and creatively use um, stochasticity in a way that doesn't destroy the rest of the behavior. Now, the interesting thing, or one interesting aspect of this computer model is that if we tune it to be highly nonlinear, then it doesn't look like a fly at all. It becomes very you know, disorganized and then random, even though it's you know, non-random. And I've always wondered why that is. I don't really have a very good answer. We can't explore the state space of this, uh, of this uh, maybe now we can, but back then, in, in, in over 10 years ago now, we couldn't. Um, we could explore the state space of the model to find maybe find a way where we have the slope and it looks like a fly. But um, what I think may be quite important here um, is this function. This is the one, this is a logistic map. Those of you familiar with it will recommend it immediately. The only thing, uh, there's only two components to it. It's the state of the system, S, either at point, time point I or I minus one, and it's a parameter lambda. And it's an iterative process, and we use it in all three of those oscillators. And uh, everyone familiar with the logistic map knows that if we tune the parameter lambda like this, then the um, state s will either converge or diverge depending on the parameter lambda. And what we find is that if we tune lambda to be you know, on this side of the 3.5 something, um, then the system is linear, or the software agent is linear, and it looks like a fly. And if we tune it to be here, then it becomes, we detect the nonlinearity, and it looks like that. So in order to detect, with this method, to be, or in order to detect the nonlinearity, the flies have to exhibit in their data, in their behavior, something that we can also see here. There's some divergence, some mathematical instability that we find in the flies. Otherwise, we would not get this slope in the fly data. And so one could make the case that, without knowing precisely the details, that flies maybe, either they can choose the parameter somewhere around here, or they're exactly at that point of where linearity and nonlinearity intersect, uh, because you have to behave linear, otherwise you, you, know, you fly into a wall, uh, or into a tree, or whatever it is. Um, so you have to be linearly and predictably at some point, but you also have to be unpredictable at other points when you're exploring or when you're uh, escaping a predator or something. So there's a point to be made here. Um, what, the f what the physicists tell me um, is also quite interesting because it fits quite well to um, uh, experiments that I can't go into from the marine snail of Asia. Um, physicists in, in this particular publication uh, say that all successful practical uses of probabilities originate in quantum fluctuations. So the question here, of course, is if this, uh, these uh, circuits that give rise to this behavior are sort of amplifying quantum uncertainties, quantum events, quantum fluctuations. There is an argument to be had, as I said, not from flies, but from a marine snail of Plesia, where they've isolated a, a very similar neuron, uh, or a neuron that, that is, is uh, similar to the ones I'm trying to, going to show you very briefly in the next couple of slides, namely uh, one that makes a decision between one behavior or another behavior. That, uh, interestingly, that um, neuron uh, kicks off behavior and shows spontaneous fluctuations in, fire, in its firing patterns, even if you isolate it. So you have that sort of fluctuating behavioral variability if you isolate that neuron from all its other um, uh, connections. And, if, and the molecular properties that give rise to that are interlocking calcium uh, currents inside the cell, 
that interact very similar in the way a uh, the classic model of chaos theory in the 80s um, uh, interacted, namely a double pendulum. So you have two uh, different parts of a pendulum, and then if you start swinging, they start swinging chaotically, and it's very similar to the way these calcium channels, these calcium channels and calcium uh, currents are hooked up to each other in, in this scenario. So there's something, some preliminary data that is not published yet um, to be had for potential mechanisms to amplify um, uh, quantum noise. Um, we don't know that yet. What we, what we have done, we have manipulated um, a part deep in the fly brain, um, among, along with other things that did not have an effect. But if we switch off these neurons genetically, then the slope goes away. So we measure the output of the flies in the S map, and this slope goes away, and this nonlinear signature isn't. Uh, there anymore. Interestingly, in the meantime, this is also not published yet. Um, technical problems with these flies. Um, but in the meantime, uh, several papers have been published on the function of some of these neurons in this so-called ellipsoid body. Here you see a, you know, a, a, a schema of the fly brain. Here you have the ellipsoid body, this ring-shaped, donut-shaped structure. And what you find here is just some examples about the uh, anatomy that are not really important. What is important at this point is that if you study animals that are walking or flying with an environment where they can actually um, experience rotation, then activity in this nervous system uh, is reflecting the rotating behavior <coughs> of the animal. And that's why these neurons have been called compass neurons, so to say, because they can fire, they can provide a vector uh, with self-reference um, of the animal as to where the animal uh, is, is headed. Anyway, so heading, uh, uh, heading neurons in other words. So what this brings us to is uh, a, a modern concept of brain function, and that is not one of passively reaction, reacting to stimuli, but one that actually weighing internal and external demands, and then acting upon some combined measure of what should be done next. So you have an ongoing nervous activity that's always there, a lot of the nervous systems that we study, if we take them out of the animals, they just keep going. And so without any sensory input, so they're not passive, they're always going on. And sensory stimuli interact with this ongoing, uh, ongoing activity to then more or less change um, that ongoing activity. Now, I've shown you some of the internal processes that we can measure in the, in the output of the fly. Right? This is this. We have actions. So now let's add some environment to see how does this push-pull interaction between external and internal demands uh, operate. So we have the fly here, let's say it, uh, it attempts to turn to the right, it makes right turn in the yaw torque, and we have an infrared laser diode that can heat the animals to unpleasant temperatures, they don't like that. Um, so it's switched off when the animal attempts right turns, and it's on when animals attempts left turns. Now you have seen that um, the animals do all kinds of things, right? So they move the antennae. They probably also move the proboscis, even though I've been saying this for like 15 years and never looked. But they move their antennae and, uh, and, and the legs and the abdomen. But the only thing that we're recording is their turning attempts, right? They probably also change the wing beat frequency to change amp uh, thrust. So a whole host of things. Now I have to imagine you're flying in this totally empty uh, environment, in this empty room. You don't see no end, no beginning, and all of a sudden, it gets hot. And you've been flying there for a while, because mean as we are, we let them fly there for four minutes to just record their spontaneous preference. And then all of a sudden, we switch the computer, switches the heat on, whenever they turn. So this can be if they're left turning, in this case, if they're left turning at the moment after those four minutes and the heat comes on instantaneously, or you know, the heat comes on when they're right turning after four minutes, as soon as they go to the left. But because they do all kinds of things, they don't know. It's only we who know that connection between the behavior and the heat. So this is where they have to become creative. Because there's nothing in the environment that tells them anything about left or right. The heat comes from above. It's central on the fly. It just gets hot. There's no directionality to it. So the only way the animal can figure out what it is, it can keep doing all these things that it was doing and cross-correlate whatever it's doing with the result it has. Right? So it has to generate actions, all kinds of different actions, and evaluate the outcome. That's operant learning. Right? That's what we know from Skinner from long ago. That's what you have to do. 
And that's why this is called, you know, this is an operant contingency. We can make it easier for the fly. This is, you know, this is one part of the environment, but we'll add another part of the environment. We can make it easier for the fly. So we have a light source here that transmits the light around the fly, and we can put a light, a color filter in here, such that when the animal turns to the left, everything is green and hot. And if the animal then attempts right turns, we switch the heat off and everything is blue. That, they get it a little bit quicker, so without the colors, it takes them anywhere between 30 seconds and a minute, a minute and a half. And here, most flies get it very quickly within about a few 30 seconds or so. They can switch the heat on and off. If we switch off the heat after just a few minutes, there's no after effect. So they learn very quickly to handle the heat, but then that doesn't <coughs> have any after effect afterwards. So for that, we have to train the flies a little longer. Like eight minutes is a good, is a good uh, time period. Because this old notion of operant and classical conditioning is sort of just a procedural, a procedural <laughs> definition, um, it may be uh, important to think about uh, other ways of labeling these processes, because this is all operant, right? The torque is controlling everything, the fly is controlling everything. And the colors only predict the heat, like a Pavlovian bell would predict the heat, because the animal is operating it. And it's sort of like the rat pressing a lever and learning that the pressed lever signals food, but the non-depressed doesn't. And so it doesn't matter which way I press the lever, I'll get food. All I have to learn is the lever has to be pressed. Skinner already realized that and was quite frustrated that he couldn't take away the lever. Um, but it makes sense, especially in this context, to not talk about the procedure, because the procedure is operant in either way, but to talk about the content and the process and the process here means that here the animal can learn something about itself, its own consequences, what it does. Whereas in this case, if it learns that you know, green is bad and blue is good, it just learns something about the world. So it learns about something about self and non-self. The content of this memory is quite explicit non-self. And you will see, well, actually, if we get to it in the discussion, I can actually demonstrate you the experiments to show that it's explicitly non-self. It has nothing to do with the behavior. Whereas this can only be understood with regard to the behavior, and hence the choice in nomenclature. Now, to study the neurogenetics of that, we can take a standard canonical synaptic plasticity pathway that contains, in this case, an analyte cyclase in flies. It's called Rutabaga that makes CAMP, and then activates PKA, activates CRAB, goes to the nucleus, and so on, get long-term memory. We only, we're not going to look at long-term memory. We're just looking at very quick learning that happens after eight minutes and that we test right after the training. So we only look at the first couple of steps and that in entails the Rudolf gene in flies. The reason why this is so well known is simply because it's conserved across the Bilaterian kingdom. This is essentially one of the main reasons why Eric Kandel got the Nobel Prize in 2000 because his form of memory was just discovered to be so very widespread. So we take those Rudolf mutant flies and test them right after eight minutes of training. If for two minutes, just a two minute test right afterwards, if these flies in those two minutes um, perform or avoid the heated situation 100% for the full two minutes, we get plus one score. If the fly performs or does not avoid or only prefers the uh, punished situation, right, this is without heat, just colors and torque, um, it's minus one. So if there's no preference, it's zero. And so the Rudolf mutant flies as we know, because uh, those mutants have been discovered in classical conditioning, when they learn about odors, we also knew before that they don't learn colors either. Um, we replicate the literature, they don't show, in this case, they don't show a preference either, whereas the wild type control flies show a preference for the unpunished uh, situation. What we also know from the literature is that another gene, protein kinase C, another group of genes, they're not involved. Uh, in classical conditioning, but they're involved in memory maintenance 24 hours later. And we re replicate that here. We use a heat shock. In this case, the, these are identical flies, identical, identical flies with no heat shock, to drive an inhibitory peptide of this uh, set of genes, PKCI, which inhibits all PKC forms. And this has no effect. Expressing this under heat shock has no effect. Uh, they uh, learn the situation just fine. Now let's take the environment away colors, the predictive environment, and let's see if there is any, any effect on the situation, on the, on the learning score, right? Because this is essentially, this is a world component. Um, mind you, if flies had eyelids, 
If these flies would close their eyes, they would be in this situation. Because there wouldn't be any colors telling them when the heat would come. And what we find, even though it's the same experiment, just the colors aren't there, the rutabaga flies do just fine. They learn really well compared to the wild type. And those PKC inhibited flies do not solve this task to me uh, all that well, especially not compared to the flies where, to the identical flies where the PKC inhibitor was not expressed. So there is some very, very fundamental difference if the animal is learning about its environment, about its non-self components, about the sensory input that does not directly relate to its own behavior, and the sensory input, in this case just the heat, that is directly related to its sensory, to, to its own behavior. There's another component uh, as to why uh, this is relevant um, for the general discussion as well. Um, and that is uh, another component in this uh, self-learning mechanism that can reconcile the long-standing debate between B.F. Skinner and Noam Chomsky about uh, whether or not language acquisition uh, is an, it requires an inborn language acquisition device or is essentially an operant conditioning procedure, as Skinner claimed. And the key to that piece of data is the FOXP2 gene in humans that has been associated with uh, that has actually a connection here to London. It was discovered in the London family. Uh, that where every carrier of a mutation in this FOXP2 gene has serious language issues, uh, articulation mainly, um, without any apparent other defects. And so it's, high, it's, it's mostly specific to language, uh, this, this, uh, mutation, this mutation in, in humans. And what you'll find is that also in songbirds, if you manipulate this gene, they have trouble learning their song. And there's, this FOXP2 is one of four different members of this FOXP family in vertebrates, in invertebrates that haven't gone through whole genome duplications, as the vertebrate clade has, but there's only one FOXP gene. And what all of these experiments have in common is exactly what Skinner said. Well, this looks like ever pressing when I learn from uh, auditory and social feedback. So maybe it is like ever pressing. And, and, and Chomsky said, oh, no, this is, you know, just superficially similar. In fact, it's, it, it, the biological processes are completely different. And uh, so again, we have the superficially similar process of feedback-based learning in all cases, only that the flies, of course, are not vocal learners. So now we can test using manipulations of the Fox PG. Now we can test if it's really just superficial similarity or if there is more deeper sim biological similarity. And so we test both wild type and genetic control strains together with the FOXP mutant flies and a construct that knocks down uh, the FOXP gene and a, particular, uh, and a particular transcript of the gene. And what we find is that all those four groups learn just fine when they're allowed to learn that green means bad or blue. Of course, we alternate and uh, randomize all this. But if we ask the flies to learn self-learning to learn about their own behavior, then specifically those two manipulations show the same deficit. So it appears as if the last common ancestor of vertebrates and invertebrates, the so-called urobilitarian, already had a FOXP gene that mediated this really basic operant self-learning process by which, in this case I would say it's a motor learning process, by which animals modify their own behavior and, and uh, use feedback to modify behavioral actions. So, and this, we don't really know much about it. We know PKC is involved, we know FOXP is involved. From, only from Aplesia, from this marine snail, we know that a different pool of CAMP is involved in a different site place, but we're not quite sure how conserved that is. But we know very little about it, especially compared to all the other learning mechanisms around where we have dozens of different genes and interactions and we know it. For this process, we know very, very little other than it's conserved across the bilaterian branch. What I didn't have time to go into is um, that these different components interact in a very much similar push-pull fashion as, other, um, as one can find in other animals. 
uh, and in humans, I think one can argue that there is an inhibition and there's facilitation. We know some of the some of the neural components of those interactions, but we have different processes that are going on that it are interacting in, in, in environmental processes and internal processes that negotiate with each other. Won't have time to go into, but one of the main outcomes of this interaction is that we can't tickle ourselves. It's, this interaction makes sure that we know which part of the environment is it that we're controlling and which part is the one that we're not ex controlling. It's this ex afferent, uh, ex afferent, or the reafferent principle that allows us to distinguish reafferents from ex afferents. Ex afferents being stimuli that we don't control, and reafferents are those that we, is the afferents that we control by our own actions. How does that compare, and I'll quickly wrap that up, in uh, different organisms? If, is this, this just a peculiar fly thing, or is that, can that be observed more generally? Um, in C. elegans, with only 302 neurons, where we have the connectome since the 1980s, um, and what this, um, this uh, uh, connectome tells us is that this is a very much feed-forward dominated connectome. So one would think that everything is like just input-output, and this sort of internal stuff doesn't really happen in those uh, animals. And what you see is that you have a sensory neuron. This is a, an olfactory neuron that makes the direct connections of the numbers here, the number of connections. And those arrows are chemical connections. Those are electrical connections. And you have a direct connection to a reversal neuron such that if there is an aversive odor, this neuron fires and the animal reverses. And if it's an attractive odor, these neurons have several receptors, then uh, this neuron gets inhibited and also ABA uh, gets in. Um, however, in this simple feed-forward circuit, there are more connections, but they're also mainly dominated by feed-forward connections, but there are also some feedback connections, and there's electrical coupling. In a neuro, you know, with neural tissue being so expensive, and uh, um, only having 302 neurons, this circuit having four neurons, one really wonders what these, what 50% of the neurons are actually doing. And this is what um, Corey Bartman and her team looked at uh, in this paper from, I think, last year or the year before. The interesting thing is if you fixate the animals so that it can't move anymore, and you image those three neurons, what you find that there is a lot of activity going on, and they're, they're you know, partly synchronized. And even without any olfactory stimulation, these you know, neurons within this olfactory circuit are constantly active. And if you look at how they're active, uh, these neurons don't fire, the C. elegans neurons don't, don't spike. They have, uh, if you look at how often are they, um, uh, um, how often are they in the state of being very active or not active, then you see that there's a bimodal distribution, either they're not active or they're active in, in a simplified way. So if you look at are they on or are they off, what you find is here in colors is on and without colors is off. In 65% of, of the time, all neurons are on. In 18% of the time, only AIB is on. In 17% of the time, this circuit is silent. Now, what do these neurons do? Let's have a look. This is the input. This is the odor. Odor is presented here in gray. This is an average trace. This is what the neuron does. It shows this inhibition of an attractive odor and then rebound excitation afterwards. And those are the individual trials that you can see here. It gets dark and, uh, and, and gets warmer or colder, and the colors get uh, warmer within. There's activity in the neuron. Now let's look at the other three neurons. What you find is they don't look anything like that. And in fact, the reason that this output neuron, ABA, is so variable are those two neurons. If you genetically and by other means take out those two neurons, this output neuron that controls the behavior is a lot more similar to the input. So essentially, those two neurons, 50% of the circuit, they only exist to make the animal less dependent and less uh, reactive and more active. <clears throat> so 50% of this circuit are dedicated to the autonomy of the animal. So also in the worm, the ongoing activity modulated by stimuli is the concept by which this nervous system operates. And then in humans, uh, this is work of Marcus Reichel. Um, you put the humans in, a, in, a, in a human subjects in an fMRI scanner, and you tell them, "Don't do anything. Just let yourself um, let yourself uh, stay at rest, and uh, we'll scan you, and we'll see what happens." Important for this is that the limiting factor in the evolution of brain size was energy supply. Some of the genes that are shown the most 
strong signal of selection are actually digestive genes between uh, chimpanzees and humans, uh, are digestive genes that extract energy out of our food. And so uh, what comes now appears at first quite confusing because there's a lot of activity when we're at rest. When we shouldn't, in principle, to save energy, should be able to shut down the brain. And so what you find in the rest of those resting state networks, also called the default network here in, in this purplish color, just won't go into details of where that actually is, but if you then switch to a task, the only thing that happens is that those resting state networks go down and the task-related networks go up in this you know, sort of a push-pull fashion. Marcus Reichel then said that the additional energy burden associated with the environment may be as little as 0.5 to 1% of the total energy budget. So our brain is running at full throttle all the time, even if we're not engaged in the task. Why would that be the case? That's what they called this back then. I don't know if there are fMRI people here that can tell me if there's anything you know, excitingly new happened since then. But um, last I looked, nobody knew what it was good for. The brain stock energy, they called it. And the idea uh, that I would state here is that clearly, for one, ongoing activity modulated by stimuli, the human brain, just like all the other brains, are also constantly active. And then just switch tasks, you switch, you switch circuits. Um, clues as to what this default mode network might do might come from simple, boring tasks, repetitive tasks, and whenever there's a mistake, the, the subject makes a mistake just before the default mode network or the resting state networks come up very often. Or also in, in work from Marcus Reichel, one of the things that uh, happens, um, one of the things that you can record and find out is that if you are engaged in a task, in this case it was a button press task, the behavioral variability of in this during the task can be um, the can be explained to more than 70% by the remaining fluctuation in the uh, default mode network. <clears throat> so what I would say, and this is of course this fluctuation, this is what allows us, this behavioral variability is what allows us to find out what it is that I'm controlling. And not surprisingly, the dynamics of this default mode network are, essential, are correlated with essentially, or associated with essentially every psychiatric disorder um, you, that, that people have ever tested in the scan. So I will, I will conclude now with one of my favorite speculations about why it is that uh, we have comparatively, or some animals have comparatively large numbers of neurons in their brains. And I would say because, I mean, flies do what they do with their tiny brains just fine. Uh, a honeybee uh, can orient with its tiny brain much better over much larger distances relative to body size than uh, a rodent which they, with a huge bilateral hippocampi. Um, so it certainly, it's not the task that requires a lot of neurons. It's not the tasks that require neurons. I would make the argument that it is by large numbers of neurons we get a large number of different brain states we can be in, which allows us to have a large, a higher behavioral variability, which allows us to explore more and a larger state space for solving complicated problems. And as the returns are diminishing in, in increasing the occupied niches during evolution, at many, in many cases, we had to evolve, or other animals also had to evolve larger uh, brains and larger numbers of neurons to be able to solve the task that all the competitors could not be solving with their limited resources. And with that speculation, I'd like to thank you. <laughs> <laughs>